All right, the next of our of the so-called big three monotheistic religions um, from around the world, the next of our uh, religions of the book, or we, as we've mentioned, called them the um, uh, the Abrahamic religions, is Christianity. And um, Christianity uh, develops out of the Jewish tradition, um, centered around, as the name of the religion um, suggests, around the centrality of Jesus, the figure of Jesus Christ, who um, Orthodox Christians believe to be the promised Messiah in the Jewish tradition. So the, um, the Jewish tradition promised that a Messiah would, would, would come from the line of King David. Um, Orthodox Jews, which still, uh, at least the sects that are still talking about and looking for Messiah, believe that this Messiah has not yet come. And when that Messiah comes, we'll restore kind of the, the physical, political kingdom of Israel. Um, but for believing Christians, it was Jesus Christ who was the promised Messiah, who brought in, restored uh, the kingdom of God in a very, uh, in a much more, in a spiritual way, um, rather than in a kind of a physical, political kind of way. And as such, uh, you know, kind of bucked the expectations of most people who were looking for and expecting a Messiah of a particular stripe at the time. So let's get into this. So um, some kind of, just, first kind of a slide with just some kind of key elements uh, uh, that we might kind of say, get down to kind of the, the centrality of, of what Christianity is all about. So um, it takes us back to, if you remember that cartoon, that kind of crude cartoon I drew and showed you early in this course about what I suggest to be, you know, kind of the, the the key problem that all religions are dealing with, at least to some de degree, is this kind of this chasm that sits between humanity on one hand and God on the other. And for in Christianity, that chasm, uh, of course, is there. And in Christian belief, it's the idea that um, humanity is separated uh, from God by by sin, and so the original sin of Adam and Eve, their disobedience, they're being kicked out of the garden creates this gulf um, uh, between God and humanity that um, ultimately is so far and wide and deep, this idea that um, humanity cannot bridge that gap itself. And I would, if I had to kind of point, if I had to pick one thing that makes Christianity unique and different than all of the other religions that we're looking at, it's, it's this idea, this idea that humanity cannot save itself. I would say that every other religion in dealing with this problem suggests that, well, you know, by ritual, by meditation, by following the law, by doing this or doing that, um, you you restore that relationship. You kind of bridge that gap, as it were. But Christianity, Christianity expressed the idea that no, uh, uh, humanity humanity is so broken by sin that uh, the humanity cannot build that bridge again, and so you need uh, the savior figure. You need a figure to bridge that gap, the mediator, um, the, the Messiah, to, um, to conquer the problem of sin, to take the burden of sin of humanity onto himself um, and uh, conquer the problem of death by, by um, offering himself up as a sacrifice, um, taking on all of sin, and then defeating the darkness and the, um, the ultimate enemy of humanity of death and getting past it by being resurrected to, do, to new life. And so it's through Jesus, through the figure of Jesus, that humanity can be restored and reconciled uh, back to God. Um, and this is not something that can be earned. Um, this, this is, uh, you know, as you often will see kind of Christianity as, as depicted in popular culture, it's almost like God is Santa Claus, that if you're, if you're nice, then you get the reward, but if you're naughty, you go to hell. And that really isn't Orthodox Christianity at all. Um, and so this idea that you don't earn that gift, you don't earn that, uh, that saving grace. Um, uh, the word grace is used for a reason, is that God offers this as a, as a, as a free gift, this idea that you can't earn it. And um, uh, but by belief, by faith, um, by giving your life over to this, the uh, to the deity, um, it's a free gift from God. And so you can't, you know, earn your way uh, into heaven. You can't earn your way to reconciliation with God. It's not a checklist. It's not a naughty or nice list. Um, and so it starts with faith. Um, and the idea is that then the good works that we might kind of associate with kind of that Santa Claus view of God, in the Christian view. Uh, the kind of the, the works um, living a, a, a holy and moral life follows from faith um, this idea that it starts with faith um, belief that reconciles you with God through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ um, but then um, then the idea is that your life will reflect that um, the faith without works 
faith without uh, a, a living a moral life uh, is, is a dead faith. So, uh, just like in Judaism, there's this, a very kind of a linear conception of time. There is a moment where God speaks creation into existence, which it shares with Torah. Um, in the Christian view, then there's the fall, where uh, humanity uh, disobeys God and separates itself from God through um, um, through sin, and then uh, that um, that chasm is is bridged. Humanity is redeemed through the saving work and sacrifice of, of Jesus Christ. So uh, that saving action, um, that uh, this idea that that Jesus is the promised Messiah in the Judaic tradition, um, is is absolutely central to to Christian belief, and one of the things that makes it you know unique and, and different than all other religions. Um, so the idea is that uh, Jesus Christ is in a mystical way both kind of fully human lives a fully human life, but is also fully God at the same time, um, the, the son of the deity, one with the deity, uh, not a separate deity. And this is part of kind of the mystery and the paradox of Christian belief is that Jesus is, is both fully God, but he's also part of this holy trinity, um, where each part is fully God, but also distinct at the same time, um, and offers himself up as the perfect sacrifice to atone for humanity. So in Jewish tradition, um, they would sacrifice from time to time what they called the scapegoat. And this idea that you would ritually put kind of all the burdens and the sins and the misdeeds of the community on this animal. And then by sacrificing the animal, uh, it's as if the animal has kind of taken all of those burdens um, and pays for them by being sacrificed. Uh, but the animal is still impure itself. And so this is our sacrifice that had to be repeated on behalf of the community. And so in Christian belief, and linking it to Jewish belief, the idea is that Jesus himself is kind of the ultimate sacrifice. He's the perfect sacrifice, the only human to have lived a sinless life. Um, and of course, the irony of, of he's the, the, the person least deserving of death um, is, uh, is arrested, tried, crucified, and killed on behalf of humanity. So he's the kind of the perfect, the ultimate perfect sacrifice, the ultimate scapegoat to atone for humanity's sins uh, once and for all. And so, yes, um, you can't really understand Christianity without understanding Judaism. And so um, Christians look at you know, various prophecies uh, in, the, in the Jewish Torah, in the scriptures, and see Jesus as a fulfillment, as an answer uh, to many of those prophecies. So, yes, um, there is, yes, there is, uh, Christianity is strictly a monotheistic religion. There's this idea that God is one. But there is this mystery about the person of, of deity um, expressed in the three persons of, of what Orthodox Christians call the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, each of them fully God. Um, deity. Um, today, uh, Christianity is, is by far the, the largest religion in terms of adherence around the world, probably a rough, roughly about 2.5 billion Christians around the world out of the you know the roughly eight mil, eight billion people on the planet. Um, but this again, this that's a number that would refer to um, both you know kind of nominal you know people who are you know consider them Catholic because they were born into a Catholic family and may have ne never set foot in a church to uh, the you know in church every Sunday um, Bible believing Christians. And so it's a it, it's a it's a broad umbrella. Um, but uh, a very large one around the world. You find Christians in almost every corner of the globe. Um, and here are kind of the major divisions in, in Christianity. Roman Catholics, the biggest, 1.1 billion people. Um, the Protestant Church, which broke off from the Catholic Church, really beginning with Martin Luther um, in the 16th century, um, when he nailed his 95 Theses to the Wittenberg Church door. And um, his critique of what he, what he saw to be um, the corruption of the church at the time, and that has, um, over the last 500 years, has grown into a, also a very large um, and also many faceted, uh, um, in terms of denominations, split from the church. Um, then you have the Eastern Orthodox Church, which also split from the Catholic Church very um, in um, uh, in about 1,000 years into the the current Common Era. Um, and then the Anglican Church, which is, I guess, technically a Protestant church, but kind of broke off uh, from the church under the reign and uh, the, Eng the the reign of the English King Henry VIII, um, who had uh, lots of disagreements with and problems with the Pope, um, and broke off and started his own church. And so the Anglican Church, you can see, you know, An Anglican English, um, also a church that began in England, but it has also spread to various uh, places around the world. So. Um, 
the uh, the person of Jesus, uh, what we know about Jesus' life comes almost exclusively uh, from the Christian Gospels, um, the the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and, and John, which were all written down um, within about. 50 to 60 years of, of Jesus's life. It's, it's almost certainly that stories about Jesus circulated orally for a while before they were written down, but not the, not the hundreds of years that, we, uh, that we've seen in, in some kind of sacred scriptural um, traditions. Um, he seems to have kind of lived and spent his entire life in um, Roman-occupied Palestine in uh, the first kind of 33 years by tradition. Um, of the common era, born in Bethlehem, raised in this kind of this um, this tiny town of Nazareth in the northern part of, of Palestine, or what once once was had been uh, as Israel, was Israel. Um, very little is known of his childhood. Of course, he has the famous birth story with the with the um, with the angels and the manger and, and, and all that. Um, but uh, there's if you look in the Christian Gospels, there's, there's basically one story about him as as a kid. And it's when he's 12 years old, and um, he gets away from his parents, from Mary and Joseph, and they're looking all over for him. And when they do find him, he's debating with the rabbis in the temple, and they're blown away by the by the precocious knowledge um, and spiritualism of this kid. And um, his parents are mad at him for running away, but he he tells them, you know, you know uh, he's kind of saying, you know, didn't you know that I would be in my father's house? So he, um, it's kind of the one story that kind of points to the kind of man that he is, he's going to be. Um, and then there it kind of fast forwards to where by tradition he's age 30 and he walks his kind of his three year mission which ends with his crucifixion and his resurrection. And some have suggested that the gospels um, were written down, you know, why, why is Jesus' life depicted like this? Um, and the idea is, well, um, I mean, the gospels were writing for a, a first century, largely kind of Greco-Roman audience, which would have been familiar with kind of the hero tales of, of Greece and of Rome. And it's very much kind of how these hero narratives uh, tend to unfold. Kind of a miraculous birth story, um, a story or two about the, the hero as, as a kid, which again points to kind of future glory. And then it's around kind of around age 30. We even saw that like with um, like the Mahavir and the Buddha, right? Age 29, 30 is where they kind of begin their, their path. So that was kind of an established uh, kind of hero narrative. And um, so the, the Gospels, you know, write down, present Jesus' life in a way that certainly a Greco-Roman audience would have inherently recognized. So it's at th age 30 where he is, by tradition, uh, baptized by this figure, John, who was a kind of a messianic figure him, himself. Um, some Jews, it seems, th thought that John, the kind of this wild man out in the desert, who was baptizing people out uh, in, in the Jordan River, and... Um, and calling people to repentance, many people thought, you know, asked him, "Are you the Messiah?" And he said, "No, no, no, it's not me. Um, uh, he's going to come after me." And um, Jesus is baptized by John, and that kind of marks the beginning of his um, of his journey. And so um, we don't know a lot about this era, but there's some idea that you know, during this era, during this Roman occupation, that there may have been kind of a number of the kind of these wandering teachers that were. Um, you know, preaching, you know, redemption and salvation or, um, or revolution, uh, you know, name your, name your poison. And so was John, was Jesus, uh, kind of one of many of these itinerant teachers that were uh, doing this kind of thing uh, at the time. So, um, it's during this short period of time, again, you know, barely three years, that he gains many followers. He calls his 12 disciples to his, his side, um, but he also makes lots of enemies in the, uh, amongst kind of the, the, uh, the upper levels of, of the Jewish priesthood, the, um, the Sanhedrin, uh, the Sadducees, the, the Pharisees. Um, they, they start to hear about this, this, this man who's being followed by these crowds and he's doing miraculous healings and he's, he's not following the letter of Judaic law. And word gets out that you know people are are he's he's he's, he's claiming um, he's claiming identity with God. He's claiming the ability to, to to forgive sins, and for you know the hardcore Orthodox Jewry of the time, this was blasphemy. And according to Jewish law, that was punishable by uh, by by death. And now, of course, the problem was is that while they're you know the Jews were allowed to kind of have their own local government. Um, the Romans had the final word. Uh, Judea was a Roman province, and the last, the last word was Roman law, not Jewish law. And so the, uh, you know, the, the, the Pharisees that wanted Jesus dead 
um, they couldn't just go do it. They had to get Roman um, uh, the stamp of approval. And indeed, that's, that's what it seems to what have happened. Um, but lots of people are, you know, the word spreading. Uh, Jesus is, is the Messiah, is the Messiah. Um, and the question, what exactly does this mean? So for many Jews, you know, kind of latched onto this thought, what that meant was Jesus was going to be a king in the political sense. He's going to come in. He's going to, he's going to kick out the Romans. He's going to restore Israel to its glory days, like under King David way back when. But what Jesus presents uh, himself is, I'm not that kind of Messiah. I am the Messiah. But you're expecting the wrong thing. Um, I'm going to usher in the kingdom of God. I'm ushering something much, much, much bigger than um, something you know just for the Jewish people in this political moment, this political time. And so Jesus becomes kind of the avenue of salvation, not just for the Jewish people, but for all humanity. And that's a kind of a radical difference. Then I think that um, I mean the Gospels even present that even his disciples, uh, up until the very end. Uh, to Jesus' death and even his resurrection didn't fully understand it. They were still asking him, uh, are you going to restore Israel now? Is that going to happen now? Um, even his own disciples didn't understand kind of the massive kind of worldwide scope of what Jesus was trying to do. So here's a map. Um, so uh, here's Bethlehem down just south of Jerusalem, which by tradition where Jesus was born. Um, and uh, so the, the story goes in that famous, you know, the famous Christmas story is that um, the um, the Roman emperor had called for a census, and so everybody had to go back to their their homeland to uh, to be enrolled, so they could get a count of, of how many people were there, and you know, it was all the better to to more efficiently tax the people. And so Mary uh, is pregnant, and she goes with Joseph down to Bethlehem, which was the uh, the city of David. And so they had to go back down to kind of the their kind of their core hometown to take care of this of this business. And of course, by Jewish tradition, the Messiah came, would be born from the line of David. And so this establishes that the birth of Jesus in Bethlehem as fulfilling that particular prophecy. But Jesus' hometown is way up here in Nazareth, um, kind of really in many ways, kind of way off the beaten path, um, a kind of little kind of podunk town up here. And this is where Jesus was born and raised and, and lived out a childhood that we don't know know don't know much about. So um, his teachings focus on the kingdom of God, uh, but altogether the, the heavenly kingdom of God, the spiritual kingdom of God, not just simply a, a return to the political glory days of, of, of Israel. Um, he, pre he, he, he preached and, and taught about um, uh, the forgiveness of, 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 of sins and uh, a, a God that offers mercy. A God that can be known personally. Um, uh, our Father uses this very kind of familial terms along the uh, along the ways. Um, often taught in a very mysterious kind of way. He would often he would rarely you know answer questions with just kind of a, a straight um, you know kind of prose logical three point answer. He would often uh, answer questions by telling what we call parables uh, stories answer a question which often at the end of the day kind of raised more questions than they answered um, and so we told these stories which um, it can uh, invite many different interpretations many different angles it invite you to kind of focus on various elements of the particular story uh, to kind of to to get at a larger question in a more mysterious kind of way um, he certainly gained a following as a miracle worker, as a faith healer. The Gospels uh, describe him as, um, you know, uh, giving, restoring sight to the blind, healing the lame, healing the sick, um, even bringing the dead back to life. Um, and so he, he gets a name for himself as, as someone who was extraordinary. Um, not for just what he was doing, but what he was teaching and the way he was talking about God and uh, kind of radically changing um, um, the views and, and the uh, ideas about the relationship between humans and gods and what makes a worthy life. It was no longer about kind of just following the letter of the law uh, day to day. Um, and you know, wearing the right clothes and eating the right food and, and um, separating yourself from the others. Uh, Jesus was more about kind of breaking down boundaries. And um, you know, uh, he you would find him um, with the poor and with the sick and the outcast and with the prostitutes and the tax collectors and all the people that um, were uh, on the bottom. Um, that's where Jesus went. And that's where, um, again, he, he, he courts a lot of controversy. And, um, uh, but as a social reformer, he, um, he, he focuses on, uh, on, on the poor and on the outcast primarily. Um, yeah, so he accepted a variety of people, 
um, particularly the marginalized, uh, the people at the fringes that would have been rejected by the elite Jewish society of the time and Roman society. Um, and uh, while he says yeah, the, the law was important, uh, is important, uh, that's a starting point. It's not the be-all, all, end-all. Um, he preached forgiveness of sin over the punishment for, for sin. And so you have um, these, these, these things that were certainly, well, you know, kind of radical in any day and age, but certainly uh, of the time is that, you know, if someone strikes you on, on one cheek, you don't get revenge, turn the other cheek to him, allow him to hit the other one. If someone um, asks for your, your sandals, give him your cloak as well. Love your enemies. Uh, during, in the Roman era, there's hardly a more radical idea. Uh, the Roman is no, crush your enemies, destroy your enemies. And Jesus says, no, pray for, love your enemies. Um, there's, a, a, in, there's an episode in the gospel where it seems, I, I think it's Peter, one of his disciples, wants to impress Jesus with the, kind of like how he's getting it. And he says, you know, if my neighbor has wronged me, um, how do I, you know, how many times do I, um, do I um, forgive him? Seven times? And the idea is that Peter kind of thinks this is a, this is a lot going on. Um, and uh, Jesus says, no. Not seven times, seventy-seven times, or in some ways it's interpreted seventy times seven. This idea that there's no end to forgiveness. So, um, all right. Sorry about that. That blip. One of my boys was having a meltdown upstairs. I don't know. I'm sorry if that if that if that bled through onto the recording. But back to this. Um, so Jesus claimed that he could speak with the authority of God, that he could, among other things, forgive sins, and that's one of the things that um, that set off the um, kind of the local Jewish uh, priestly establishment. And so, um, for you know, under Jewish law, that kind of uh, the claiming of that ability to forgive sins, which only God could do, um, he was uh, the the Jews wanted to to, uh, to put him to death, um, labeled him as a blasphemer under their own religious rules. But like I was saying, um, they, they had to get this past the, the Roman law. Only the Romans could put a criminal uh, to death. And so what the, um, his enemies, his Jewish enemies, um, were focusing on was his, kind of his claims of, of revolution and his idea that he was a king and therefore overthrowing Roman rule. And that's what would get him in trouble on um, on the, that kind of the level that would get the attention of, of of the Romans, and so he could be brought up on, on charges of of, of treason, um, and therefore be handed over to be to be put to death. So, according to the Christian Gospels, um, the 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 Jewish priesthood makes their case that Jesus is a political revolutionary, and so he is brought up on on charges and brought behind, uh, up before this figure Pontius Pilate, who. Um, was the the procurator kind of a, a, the Roman governor of Judea at the at the at the time, and um, the, the 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 Christian Gospels paint Pilate as kind of a, a wishy washy figure. That he interrogates Jesus, but famously doesn't find anything worth certainly not worth the the, the death penalty, and he tries to weasel a lot of his decision. Um, that, but the Jews demand Jesus's blood. Um, and ultimately, Pilate gives in to kind of the popular demand, and he turns over Jesus to be whipped and to be uh, put to death by means of, of crucifixion, um, you know, the, uh, nailed to a nailed to a cross, um, and to kind of slowly die in this torturous way that the that the Romans um, reserved for uh, the worst of the worst, or for I should say, you know, non non Romans. Um, but in the Christian story, um, until Jesus is buried. And on the third day following, and so by tradition, he's crucified on uh, a Friday, and that's the first day, and then Saturday, and then Sunday, the third day, um, he um, he he uh, is raised from the dead. He resurrects, and um, he appears to his followers um, who are bewildered and uh, overjoyed, um, confused uh, by this. And, um, and that's kind of the last, the, the, so the last enemy has been conquered is that, um, so he was the perfect sacrifice, the perfect scapegoat in the Jewish tradition, taking on all of the sins of humanity onto his shoulders um, and, uh, and dying um, and therefore um, kind of bridging the gap, cleansing, um, uh, uh, cleansing humanity of their sins 
and reconciling humanity to God, but then also his resurrection um, over death uh, is the defeat of the kind of the final enemy of humanity uh, itself. Um, according to Christian tradition, he he remains um, in his resurrected human body for forty days, and then he ascends into heaven. Uh, telling his disciples to go and make uh, disciples of of, of, uh, uh, of people in my name around the world, and uh, baptizing them in my name, and then with a promise that he would um, he would one day one day would, would return. So um, after Jesus's uh, time on Earth, the uh, the disciples uh, start to spread this gospel throughout Judea first and then throughout the Mediterranean world. Uh, Peter um, becomes sometimes, he's sometimes called kind of the prince of the disciples. Um, he uh, kind of starts to kind of spread the gospel throughout uh, Judea, establishes an early Christian church in um, and around Jerusalem before you know, also kind of taking uh, the, the, the gospel story out into the, into the Mediterranean world. Peter winds up in, in Rome where by tradition he was ultimately martyred and, and killed and crucified himself. Um, but the great missionary of early Christianity is Paul. Now, Paul was not a original disciple of Jesus. In fact, he was, um, the story goes, is that he was actually a persecutor of early Christians. He was, Paul was kind of a hardcore, orthodox, uh, educated Jew. And he did not like this new church that was spreading. Um, but he claims he, he says he has this, this um, miraculous conversion experience where he's struck blind on his way to Damascus. And, um, and he's later healed of that blindness. But in that moment, uh, he's confronted uh, by the voice of God, by the voice of Jesus that asks him, you know, why are you persecuting me? And he does this 180 after that, and he becomes kind of the the great missionary of early Christianity. And so um, between the work of Peter and Paul and uh, by tradition, the other disciples, uh, churches are established throughout Europe, throughout the kind of the ring of the Mediterranean. Um, it remains small and occasionally kind of came into conflict with kind of Roman law in, in kind of uh, short bursts, but in kind of fiery and destructive ways under emperors like Nero, where um, we think that both Paul and Peter were probably uh, rounded up in Rome and and martyred and killed at that time, um, but first the kind of first three centuries of the Common Era, the church remained small but kind of growing um, uh, in, in various pockets around the Mediterranean. Um, yes, Roman emperors like Nero, Domitian, Diocletian were ones that uh, under whom there were kind of intense periods of persecution. But for the most part, um, probably your everyday Roman thought Christians were I don't know kind of probably you know at at best weirdos, at worst treasonous, but uh, for the most part they were kind of left alone as long as they kind of kept their heads down, it, it seems, but it did erupt into times of, of persecution. Um, the big change in terms of uh, kind of the um, proliferation of Christianity was when the Emperor Constantine, um, who was a late Roman Emperor, uh, this kind of really in some ways near the end, this kind of the last gasp of the Roman Empire. Um, you can make the argument that Constantine was what kind of the last of the great Roman emperors, uh, depending on how you define these things. But Constantine uh, is a, uh, a man who has uh, also claims to have this kind of this miraculous conversion story, where he sees a vision where he's fighting an arrival for the throne of Rome, and he receives this vision of some symbol of Christianity, uh, probably not the cross yet, yeah, that had not come uh, into being as kind of the primary Christian symbol. But he sees a symbol of Christianity in this vision or a dream, and he hears the voice or hears the words that say, in this, in this sign you will conquer, in this sign you will have victory. And so by tradition, uh, before he goes off into battle, against his rival for the Roman throne, he paints that symbol on all of his men's um, banners and standards and shields. And he goes out and he, uh, he wins a victory in a rout. Absolutely just um, decimates his, his enemies. And thereafter, he kind of dedicates his reign to the Christian God. And one of the first things that he, do, he does politically is he, he issues this Edict of Milan, as it's called, which legalizes Christianity. Doesn't make Christianity the official kind of religion of the Roman em Empire. That kind of comes later, really, in, in as uh, kind of Europe develops into kind of the Holy Roman Empire, and, and we get the you know the the, the Vatican and the, and the and the Pope and that kind of thing. But what Constantine did is he says it's uh, you can't persecute these people anymore. 
um, he legalizes, and that really allows the church to kind of come out of the shadows. And with Constantine, there's some debate about to what degree was Constantine himself really kind of a believing Christian. We don't really know. But now they had, you know, an emperor uh, on the throne who was sympathetic to their beliefs. And this allows the church to kind of come out of the shadows and grow very rapidly and start to exert an influence and um, power and uh, political power in ways that it had never been able to, to do before. And so, um, yeah, in the, around the year 380, it becomes the official religion of, uh, of Rome. Um, we're kind of seeing kind of the Christianization of what, what at this point is kind of left of the Roman Empire. Um, and then it grows apace from there. Um, you use that, this is, it's, it's not long after that kind of Rome itself, or what we would call the Vatican, which is kind of within Rome today, becomes kind of the seat of, of not only kind of the, the church spiritual power, but political power. Um, there is kind of the first big split is in 1054, where we see this split between um, kind of the, the Roman Catholic Church and uh, the Eastern Orthodox Church, a split which is still there today. Um, and it splinters in, in various fashions uh, down the line as well. Um, we'll get to that in, in, in probably the next presentation. Um, but it's really when Constantine legalizes Christianity that it really kind of explodes in terms of obvious growth and obvious influence um, and quickly becomes um, kind of a political movement um, alongside a, a spiritual a spiritual movement. So I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, pause this presentation here or stop this one here and pick this up in part two next time.